This is Edge of the Box, a podcast brought to you by whoscored.com. Hello and welcome to Edge of the Box, a podcast by whoscored.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and give this video a comment and a like at some stage as well. I'm Dan Bardell, overseeing proceedings, and I'm joined as ever by stats nerd Martin Lawrence and renowned football writer Jonathan Wilson. Now, Jonathan, to, to start with, coming to you for, for an early comment here, as, as renowned as you are, off the back of last week's mid-season review, your team of the season finished last in our poll by quite a fair distance. Is, is that going to affect you going into this week's podcast? No, people are stupid. <laughs> 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 the fact that Martin's team won with no midfield. Thomas I mean, Alger, he can, he can run. The, what's what's the public ever won? Nothing. Martin, were you, were you surprised to win? Not at all. Not at all. No. Best team, wasn't it? Statistically, it was the best team, which does fit in with the <laughs> podcast, which I, I suppose augurs well for, for the rest of the show. So c- congratulations to you, Martin. We are obviously going to talk about the big, big game, Manchester United against Liverpool at the weekend com- coming up. But we're also going to look at some a few other games as well, starting with Leicester v Southampton. Now, Martin, I think you said that um, Leicester had the best chance of finishing in the in the top six last week and Jonathan Southampton. So, so to start with, Martin, why is that? First and foremost, obviously, Leicester slightly better placed at the moment. Obviously, it's only a three-point gap, I think, to Saints. So that could change this weekend. Um, but I just think the way that the, the position that they are now, based on the sort of injuries that they've had, um, it's just uh, just highlights that their squad depth is probably underrated. Um, obviously, Madison's been out and Diddy's been out. Pereira's been out for the whole season. soyunju has been out for pretty much the whole season. Mm. Um, and those players are all, all coming back now. Um, so I expect them to be stronger. Um, I'm not saying that they'll build on their points tally necessarily, because I think other teams will be will be stronger in the second half of the season too. But I think it st- certainly stands them in good stead for the rest of the season. And I think Madison, in particular, where he was sort of he was not fit enough to start games for the first sort of month or two of the season, he's sort of been improving with every week. Uh, sort of been overlooked a bit, obviously in the in- England discussion uh, where he's where he's been injured, but he's been been improving looks looks at the player that we knew he was um i expect Pereira to be back and i expect sundu to be back so when those players are back it will actually be a bit of a dilemma for for brendan rogers because obviously james justin um for farner castagna who come in and he's been injured as well but they've all been impressive uh, so yeah. how you fit them all in well you don't um so who misses out is is a question but i think um, yeah, their squad depth is is really underrated. I think it's probably one of the strongest in the league if they had if they had everyone available. Um, so I think we'll see over the next sort of few games after this Southampton game as well. I think they play Everton, Chelsea, and Leeds, which are three tough tough fixtures. Um, we'll see what Leicester's level really is because I think if they can if they can stay in the top four by the end of that sort of run going into February, then. I think they've got a decent chance of staying there, personally. Yeah, Jonathan, I mean, what Leicester have done can't, can't be sniffed at, really. As Martin mentioned, a lot of injuries and also to, to come back from the end of last season where they pretty much chucked away and nailed on top four place. Really, very, very impressive. But you you obviously think that Southampton are gonna have got more chance of finishing in the top six. And is one of the things that impresses you about Southampton that they're consistent, sir? Yeah, the consistency. I mean, look, I think let's have a really good chance of finishing the top six. They might both finish in the top six. The the, the two doubts I have about Leicester, one is the fact that they're, in, they're still in Europe and and the the impact that might have. Uh, the second, and this is where it sort of relates to Southampton, is and I take the point about the injuries that that, that clearly has um, affected how how they've been able to play, but. They, Leicester only had four players who scored more than one goal this season. Southampton have had six, and so they do seem, even with with Barnes, even with Madison, they are still very reliant on Vardy, who I, th- I think has scored eleven of the thirty-one goals this season. Um, and so I, look, I know Vardy never gets injured, but were he to get injured, that would be a huge issue. Were he to 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 become fatigued, that would be a huge issue. So those are my slight doubts about them. But yeah, Southampton, I, I think. They're they're playing well. Their press is really good. The press can can unsettle 
uh, the top side, as we saw against Liverpool, but also they have the huge weapon of Ward Prowse. So even if they're not playing well, they have that option from dead balls. And it's not just that he can, you know, he can score from free kicks. His delivery from corners or, or set plays wide for Vestergaard, uh, it, it, it gives them that option uh, or an opportunity to score goals even in games when they're, they're a little bit under the cosh. So that, that's that's the only reason I, I, I slightly favour Southampton. But yeah, Leicester have been brilliant as well. Yeah, I think if I was pushed, I'd probably go Leicester, but it is very, very tight between the two teams. Now, Martin, if you were compiling a team, much like we did last week, if you had a choice of Vardy or Ings to be your striker, which one would you choose? Well, obviously, it depends on the setup of the side. Um, but well, Obviously, Martin. <laughs> um, one plays up front in his own, one plays in the two. So um, I'd, I'd go Danny Ings probably if we're taking everything into account in terms of age okay. and everything else. like I'm really 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 impressed by Danny Ings I must say um over the last sort of obviously 18 months or so uh it's not just his goals his work rate's outstanding and his, and his link-up play is really good as well and he's strong yeah so I don't think he lacks a lot obviously he doesn't have the the pace in behind that the body has um but yeah I, I'd probably just go Ings same question to you Jonathan and to be honest, a very similar answer. In in some ways, Vardy, but... Uh, and he doesn't get injured, which is the good thing. But clearly, he is older than Ings. Um, and... Well, I'll say Vardy, just just because I, I, I worry that Ings gets injured more often. Uh, but but the age thing is a is a is a problem if I'm if I'm looking to build a squad for the future. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and it's it's, a, it's problematic when you're picking those terms as as we saw last week. The one one thing with Vardy is he seems to age backwards. He seems to get quicker every season. It's, it's really weird because how old is he now? 30, 33? Am I right in saying he's, he's 33 now, Vardy? 32, yeah, 33? So, at least. Yeah, so think you'd so. think he'd show signs of slowing down at this at this point, but as I say, he seems to get better every season, which is amazing. Since he turned 30, everyone says he's basically been in the best shape of his career in the last sort of two years. So, yeah, what you say about um, ageing backwards, he's got that Benjamin Button about him, hasn't he? And he's... Um, yeah. Yeah, he's just never never lost any pace, which is the main thing. I think most players, when they get to that sort of age, they they lose a yard. And to now, at least, he, he just hasn't seemed to. Well, I think the thing about him is it's not just his pace and his finishing. You whenever, and, and this is one of those things that you really miss not being in the stadium. But um, you know, when we could still go to games regularly, the thing that always struck me when I watched him is is not just how busy he is out of possession, but how intelligent his movement is out of possession. And something Brendan Rodgers always goes on about is how tactically smart he is, how good he is at leading the press. So, yeah, I think Vardy, you know, he's just a really interesting case of somebody who, who obviously reached the elite level of football quite late, and that possibly has extended his career. But also, you can almost see the development in him still. He's still learning the game, and he's still getting better at those more tactical aspects of it. Yeah, also the fact that his diet consists of, of a lot of Red Bull probably bodes well for me, because I've got to say, <laughs> I have a lot of Red Bull, although there's no signs of me aging backwards at all. At the time of, of recording this podcast, there is actually still some games going on. There's, there's a game tonight to take place, but also there's games of the weekend, which we're going to preview as well. But I just wanted to come to you and get your tactical highlight from the midweek games, Jonathan and Martin, your top stat from the midweek matches. I'll go to you first, Jonathan. I mean, in some ways, it's not a highlight, it's a low light, but just the way Tottenham keep on doing the same thing. that they. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't quite so pronounced against Fulham because I think Fulham started the game relatively well, but they take the lead against a team they're expected to beat exactly as they had against Palace, exactly as they had against Wolves, and then they, they, they sort of voluntarily sit off and they, they, you know, they, they let Fulham come back at them. And yeah, look, Fulham were creating some chances early on, so it, it wasn't quite as as stark as other two games. But that same pattern of uh, of just not keeping the foot on the throat when you've got the advantage. And when you include the the, the, the late concessions against West Ham and against uh, Liverpool, which, OK, that was to go from a draw to a, to a defeat rather than a win to a draw, and, and the Newcastle game, which is probably the most freakish of, of a lot, you know, that's now a lot of points. It feels like they've fritted away. That's, what, 11 points they've tossed away. Yeah either by conceding late or by sitting off and conceding the initiative. And they're only what, six points off the top at the minute. So mm. even if they'd taken half of those 11, they'd be, well, they'd be half a point off the top. But um, <laughs> say they're taking six of those 11, um, they, they'd, be, they'd be level at the top. 
Yeah, crazy that they, they keep throwing it away. I mean, Son hitting the post last night was a massive moment. But I've got to say, actually, I was very, very impressed with Fulham. I thought they were very good. And I'm, I'm a big fan of the way Scott Parker's consolidated them a bit more over the last few months and got them playing nice football, but more smarter <laughs> football. I'd say, Martin, your tactical highlight? No, sorry, your uh, top stat? Well, it's probably the first is probably better, to be honest, because I couldn't really find a stat uh, that I found to be that interesting. So, yeah, so <laughs> I'm just going to dig in on Jonathan's section. Uh, and on the same game, really, it's, it's more just a highlight in terms of Fulham. I just think they deserve, like you say, I think they deserve a, a huge amount of credit. Uh, after three games, I think most people thought they would be the sort of team that are in Sheff Sheffield United's position. They look like a team that could be one of the worst uh, in Premier League history. Yeah. Um, that's what people were saying at the time, at least, because they were just so disorganised. I think last night they played with a back six, essentially. So they played a back three with wing backs and, the, and I'm including the goalkeeper in this. All new signings. Incre just incredible. Like an entire defensive system of new signings that are playing incredibly well together. I think that's remar I think it's pretty remarkable. I don't think it's really got that much attention. For to, to, and I think Scott Parker probably deserves a great deal of credit as well because his, his sort of credentials at top flight level were probably questioned as well. Yeah, uh, but to have organised a defence that had never met, <laughs> let alone played together, um, to the level that he has over the last few months, um, it's just incredible. And and their recruitment po policy, obviously, last time when they got relegated was widely panned, of course, and understandably so. And people thought that they'd basically done the same thing. They'd just signed too many players, too many average players. And to be fair, I thought I thought the exact same. But the signings that they've made have come in and done really well, that are particularly in defence. Um, Anderson, who's the captain out of nowhere, Joachim Anderson's the captain, having sort of failed to make the grade at Lyon. He's still a young defender, Adarabayo, very young. Anthony Robinson, very young. So it all bodes pretty well. Ola Aina's still young as well. So it all bodes pretty well for them. And I think they look they look every bit of Premier League team right now. So, And that just didn't look like being the case. So just, just a little bit of a love in for Fulham, who haven't had much praise in, in sort of recent years, I guess. Yeah, got to say, I love the goalkeeper as well, Areola. I think he was a, a really smart signing. Probably his level is higher than Fulham's, I would say, but he, he's a player I really like. And they, they could have nicked it at the end. I don't know whether you watched the game last night, Jonathan. There, there was every chance they could have nicked it. Yeah, oh yeah, there, there was. I mean, it, the, the last sort of 10, 15 minutes uh, uh, was was actually you know really good game. That the Tottenham had the chance as well. Yeah, they had the offside goal. Uh, but yeah, I mean... If either side had won it, it would have been fair enough. It was a, I thought it was a really good game of football, but one that Tottenham needlessly let slip. Yeah, I, th I think you're spot on with what you say there. We now move on to Arsenal against Newcastle. And I've got to say in this next section, I worry for, for Steve Bruce. He's getting it from, from all quarters at the moment. And I think we've all got our own individual experiences of Steve Bruce at our own football clubs <laughs> as well. Martin, if every team was going to lose to Sheffield United... It was going to be Bruce's Newcastle, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, yeah. I think, yeah, they just sort of, they're levelling out now. And I think, um, obviously, Steve Bruce's football has never changed. And it's not like they've they've dropped off from an incredible level. Um, but I think the main issue for them is some maximums, um unavailability. And obviously, the unpredictability that he brought to that Newcastle team just isn't there now. And if you don't have unpredictability from a single source in a, in a Steve Bruce team, then you are the most predictable team in the league. Yeah. Um, it, it, they're just playing standard Steve Bruce football now. And without that sort of bit of magic, they're just, uh, <laughs> there's no escaping it. They're just a, a pretty dismal team to watch. I think obviously Callum Wilson's been affected as well by not having, not having him there. So Maxman's not got great sort of, output in terms of goals and assists but just the fear that he strikes into teams and there's there's nobody to fear in Newcastle's team now without him um so yeah Wilson's strong start has dissipated a bit and I think even that signing I wasn't entirely convinced by just because Callum Wilson's a, a decent striker hard working decent enough at bringing others into the game but his his goal scoring has always been reliant on having big chances created for him and that isn't Newcastle that isn't a Steve Bruce team and obviously he scored a few penalties as well, but he doesn't score goals out of nothing. And that's what no. Newcastle need because they, they, the creativity just isn't there. And uh, yeah, we like, like you say, we've been there as a fan of a Steve Bruce club and um, 
yeah, it, it, there comes to a point where things just don't look good at all. And I think we're at that point with Newcastle now. Jonathan, I'm going to guess the answer. I'm going to preempt what you're going to say, but do you feel sorry for the Newcastle fans with, with what they're having to endure at the moment and what they're having to watch? Um, in as much as I feel sorry for any fans, yeah. I mean, I, I think fans and uh, the narratives of suffering are a little bit tedious, but I can completely understand why Newcastle fans are, uh, are frustrated. Um, and, you know, there's there's very little to get excited about. I mean, it's very hard to see where this, where this turns around. Um, it's very hard. You know, it's it's not a lovable team, uh, yeah. and the one lovable player is Sam Maximan. He's now not there, so uh, I suspect that were fans in the stadium, the atmosphere would be pretty toxic and 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 making it even worse. But that toxicity would be, I, I think, totally understandable. I mean, I, you know, I remember when Bruce manager of Sunderland, Sunderland going on a, a, a mm -hmm. run of 108 days without a win, but Bruce somehow survived. Uh, and then suddenly it sort of clicked back into gear and they, uh, I think Sunderland beat Bolton 4-0 or 4-1 to end that run and Darren Bent got a hat-trick. And then the rest of that season, it was it was suddenly okay. But, I, I, I mean, we talked about this before, haven't we? The Bruce teams, the, 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 there's, there's, it seems very dependent on momentum, that the, there's no sort of internal logic to it. Suddenly you get on a good run and then suddenly you get on a bad run and it's almost like Bruce isn't really affecting that. Uh, so Newcastle have had injuries, yeah, to be fair to them. I mean, the cell being out as well, Selvi, uh, Shelby's out. Um, Fraser's obviously suspended for, for, for this game as well. But it, yeah, it's that some maximum absence is, is, the, is the huge problem. And I, I just sort of think there's such a, such a sense of negativity about the place now that it's very hard to see how they, how they break this cycle without getting rid of Bruce. Devil's advocate, Martin, a little bit here. Do you think they're much worse than they were under Benitez? I mean, I thought they had a decent season last year. I think it did about what could be expected, which is pretty much what Benitez did as well. Am, am I right in thinking that? Yeah, in terms of the sort of the results-wise, yeah, I can understand that. And it's not like Newcastle fans have been used to seeing this incredible football for years, uh, for the last sort of few years, at least under Benitez, because he is a very pragmatic coach. But I think what you saw with Benitez, you could see that in certainly in games where they weren't expected to win, his tactics really worked. Um, and he just sort of seemed to have a better clue of what he was doing. And mm. with Steve Bruce, sometimes he, he can pull off a result, but it is generally just backs against the wall and then hope for, hope for the best uh, approach, really. Um, so, yeah, I don't think you ever come away from a Steve Bruce game thinking, oh, yeah, he's... To coin a big sound phrase, he's he's out tactic, out tactic did him here or, or however you say it. Um, so yeah, I think the the <laughs> to compare Steve Bruce and Rafa Benitez is probably a bit of a stretch. Even though I, I do get what you get where you're coming from in terms of neither of them play this sort of exhilarating football. Um, so yeah. Well, I think the other huge difference is, I mean, you know, obviously the managers are very different in terms of experience, well, not in terms of experience, but in terms of level of experience and in terms of uh, of their apparent capabilities. But I think losing Salomon Rondon, which I think actually was what finally broke Benitez and persuaded yeah. him to go, that, you know, um, I can't remember the precise details, but they basically Rondon would have would have broken their you know, their threshold for for, for a fee for uh, a player over thirty, and so they didn't spend it, and then went and wasted all that money on Joe Linton, and Rondon, I, I just think is one of the, in, in terms of doing one specific job really really well, he's one of the greatest footballers who's ever existed. <laughs> I, I I absolutely adore Salomon Rondon. <laughs> that if you want if you want to send it forward to play 30 yards 40 yards from his nearest teammate and hold the ball up win throw-ins win free <laughs> kicks get something he is brilliant and that was the way Newcastle played to him and it's the way Venezuela played to him and he's really really good at that um and and, and he'll bring you sort of 10 12 goals a season uh so to to, to sacrifice him for the sake of uh, you know a a relatively small amount of money in football terms uh, and and then waste the money. I, I think there's the uh, initially on Dwight Gale and then on you're know, far worse on Joe Linton. Just made no sense at all. Um, that you know, it was an attempt to sort of impose a very strict financial rationale on something that I think should always be a little bit more nuanced than that. But also just defied all football logic. And at some point, when you're in a football club, football logic should apply. 
Yeah, but it never, it never does at Newcastle. And I suppose that can be one defence of Bruce is that it's, it's a toxic club anyway. And it's just it's just run really badly. I mean, the Joel Linton thing that you've just said pretty much sums it up. They've, they've looked at replacing one big striker with another big striker, but not actually looked at how that second big striker play, plays the game of football. So it hasn't worked at all. They are well, a mess, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel sorry for Joel Linton because I, I don't think he's a terrible footballer. He's just, being, he's just been dumped into an awful environment where... You know, he's not as good as the bloke who came before him, and he's never played anything like that bloke. But he's been asked to do that, so yeah, he, you know it, it, it's he's it, you know he's just a man completely in the wrong place who, whose career is kind of is being ruined by this. And I mean, maybe he should have done a bit more due diligence and said, "I am not really sure that that's for me." But yeah, it's it's it, yeah, it's just a uh, another symptom of, of how badly that club's run. Yeah, Martin, a few weeks ago, maybe a trip to Arsenal, Bruce might have looked at that and thought, mm, this might be a game where I can get myself out of trouble, but they've picked up, haven't they? Yeah, they have. And I think a lot of it's obviously the, the sort of man or the boy who's got, got the attention in that run has been ML Smith-Rowe uh, yeah. in recent times, and, and for good reason, really. I think he's been a breath of fresh air, really. Um, and I think to an extent, I think we had a piece in The Guardian on this that he sort of bought Arsenal some time in terms of in terms of what they do in the transfer window, because they could go and spend this summer, uh, this month, but also they've probably got the chance to, to wait now uh, and, and, and think about it a little more, possibly get a better deal uh, and, and look into it in the summer because he's just, yeah, he's, he's just playing with that urgency that Arsenal have completely lacked. And he, he's just sort of got, he, there's a freedom about him. He plays one touch football, pass and move. He's just sort of, Everything that you sort of recognised in the sort of Arsenal of old in terms of how they play, I'm not, I'm not trying to big him up to say that he, he's of that level, but he plays in that way where he's, he's just got great spatial awareness uh, in advanced areas and he knows, he knows where his teammates are and that's, that's just linking Arsenal together really nicely and that's just what they've lacked in terms of sort of the likes of William and Pepe who've really struggled and uh, I think obviously players like that who are on big money and don't have the same incentive, so to speak, to, to go and impress. Um, he's he's done exactly that, and he's got he's got more assists than any other Arsenal player in all competitions this season. And I think he's played about three hundred and fifty minutes, so that <laughs> says it all, really. Um, so yeah, they, they, they've improved as a team, no doubt, at, at both ends. But I think he's been absolutely pivotal. Yeah, just before we move on from this game, Jonathan, my own experience of Steve Bruce has always been. If he needs a result, if he really, really needs it, he'll probably sneak it. Do you see him getting anything at the Emirates? Well, the, the I mean, no is the basic answer. <laughs> but the the one the one thing you might say is uh, that Arsenal made pretty heavy weather of beating him in the FA Cup, and had yeah. that Smith Rowe red card stood. I mean, I I don't think it should have done, but equally, it wouldn't have been a complete travesty uh, had it stood. Then, then maybe that would have been different, but. Um, you know, Lacazette's back in form, scored in the last three league games. Obviously, it's before the Palace game, if I'm saying that. Um, so, yeah, they, they they look like they've got a bit of bit of zip and zest back about them and, and Newcastle just haven't got any of that, plus a load of injuries. OK, so no chance at all then, Martin? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Fair, fair, fair enough. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that neither of you are going to choose that one as your long shot later on in the Probably show. Not. We now move on to, to the big one, the one that I introduced in the wrong order in the intro of the show. It's Liverpool versus Manchester United at Anfield. For some reason, I introduced it in the American way, Manchester United at Liverpool. But So I don't know why I did that, but never mind at all. So massive, massive game. But before that, we've got the massive, massive trivia, and I think we're going to change things up a little bit this week, Martin. Yeah, no, well, keeping it fresh. No, no, keeping doesn't it affect fresh. you, Jonathan. Doesn't affect you. <laughs> so basically, it's even more convoluted than last time, whereby there are three answers. There are three answers to the question. If you get two of them, then you get the point. Uh, one. To be fair, if it's only one, I probably think I should probably get the point. One out of three. It's not enough to get a draw, is it? Mm-hmm. Don't know what and, it, and, and if I get three, if you get three, then phew, you get double points. Um, double points. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, wow. so Go on then, Martin. relatively similar theme to something we've done before. Um, 
but only three Liverpool players, current Liverpool players, have ever scored more than once against Manchester United. Name those three players. Does it have to be for Liverpool or is it, can it be for different teams? It can be for different teams. Um, different teams. In, in total or in a single game? In total. Only three have ever scored more than once against Manchester United in their career. Yeah. Wow. I found it quite interesting, so we'll see. That is a big question. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit worried at how I'm going to perform for the rest of this podcast. I've thrown you off there, whirling. yeah. I saw your it's face. Gonna be, it's yeah, like, that's going to be whirling around, whirling around my mind, that is, for the, for the rest of the show. And I've, I've got a show to lead here, so I, I could do without that stress. Liverpool, Man U then. Man U have gone top of the league this week. An incredible turnaround, really. Solskjaer probably won't get the credit he deserves, Jonathan, but he probably does deserve some. Um, or not <laughs> well, it's a slightly slightly leading question um i i think solskjaer is very good at setting up a team to play on the break which is a good thing mm. uh i think he's got some excellent players there now you know fernandez cavani i think have made a, a huge difference over the past year uh maguire's back in form and so they're, they're, you know, they're defending relatively well as well uh so you know he's got a basic structure there and he's got good players within that structure and recently, they, they've been scoring goals when they need to, getting a bit of luck when they when they need it. Yeah, so the, the Pogba deflected goal um, uh, against Burnley, uh, the penalty against Villa. You know, things have been going going their way. Um, where I still have my doubts is how good is he at at setting up a coordinated attack to break down a defensively solid side. And the, the nature of being manager of Manchester United is you will beat some teams who are worse than you just because you have better players and, you, you know, if you get an early goal, well, obviously the dynamic of the game changes. But I think, you know, that, 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 that Palace game, which is what their first home game of the season, that remains the big worry for me, that if you, if you meet a team like Palace who are, who are defending well, do they have a way with all to break them down? And I would still question whether they do that. I also have heard some slightly um what's the word i'm looking for Let, let's say certain top players there are not entirely convinced that the training is absolutely top level okay bit of bit of itk there bit of bit of behind the scenes knowledge i mean to be fair to, to man U, they come up against a good defensive side like they did against villa a few, a few weeks ago usually the way they beat them is, is to get a penalty they're, they're very good at getting penalties and, and martin it's usually fernandez that dispatches them i saw in the week actually a nice little stat for you here that since fernandez has signed for manu they've got more points than anyone else in the, in the premier league but that's a, that is a really interesting stat isn't it yeah it is and obviously he's had a He's had a massive impact, but I agree, I agree with Jonathan just in the sense that I'm not, I don't want to get down on Manchester United here because there has been a turnaround and they are improving and they do deserve credit for that. But if you actually sit, go back and look at their results in the league, at least, um, they're basically just getting the points that you expect them to get, which is good, which is fine. Um, but the, I still think there's a question there about whether they can win games like this weekend. So they haven't. Um, they haven't this season, at least. Uh, and I just think, yeah, if you if you look back, they're basically the, the games where they're sort of you'd you'd think they're they're probably the slight better team and should win it. They're, they're basically winning games by one goal most of, most of the time. And I think the, the games where you expect them to be sort of as a similar level to the opposition, like Chelsea and Leicester, they drew those games. Um, and I think the the one result where you think, oh, they they exceeded expectations there in the league was the draw against Manchester City. But even then, that's still only a draw. So, yeah, if you look back at their results, there's, there's nothing spectacular about what they're doing at all. And I, I saw a graphic, um, I think it was yesterday, that we're at the point where Solskjaer took over after 17 games two seasons ago. Uh, and now, obviously, they're top of the league after 17 games this season. They've got 36 points. The table yeah. two seasons ago, 36 points would have been enough to sit fifth. So oh, I think really? you consider um, the drop off of the other teams, and listen, Manchester United can do nothing about that. They, like, it's not <laughs> their fault that other teams are playing poorly, um, and they have improved for sure. But in terms of their title credentials, I still, I'd still question them just on the fact that they, they generally just do what you expect them to do, and against sort of the better teams like Liverpool this weekend, it's difficult to see them 
coming out on top. They might get a draw, but whether they can win these games, I, I don't know. Yeah, and one of the things that's often levelled at Man U is that we don't really still know what the strongest team is. I mean, Pop has been playing from the left a few games recently. He was back in the middle against Burnley midweek. Do you think their strongest team is, Jonathan? Um, well, I, I wonder whether we whether talking about strongest team, I wonder how relevant that is these days. I'm not sure you need a strongest team. Um, and you know, I think rotation, the ability to adapt to opponents is essential. Yeah, I, I guess if I were picking a, a United team, um, you know, with, without being told the opposition uh, and with all players being perfectly fit, I guess it's De Gea, wan Bissaka, Bailly, Maguire, Shaw, Matichon, McTominay, Fernandes, Pogba, Greenwood. So mm. I think the right side's a bit of a problem. Cavani and yeah, Rashford. Um, but, you know, I, I, there's, there's, there's plenty of options to change within that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think this is sort of relevant to, to, to Liverpool's sort of downturn in form. If you look at United's last four games, the, just the shot count. So, v Burnley, it was 13-11. V Villa, it was 19-15. V Wolves, it was 11-9. And against Leicester, the, it was 9 against 10. So, none of those are in any way sort of a, 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 a dominant performance. Hmm. Um, whereas you look at Liverpool, who, okay, they, they absolutely battered Palace when they had 14 chances to five. So that, that does not sound like a 7-0 game. Then against West Brom, 17-5. Against Newcastle, 11-8. And against Southampton, 17-7. And they haven't won any of those those three. So that that seems to me that the problem is not really how Liverpool are playing. It's that they're not taking chances. Whereas United are at the minute in a phase when where, where, where they are taking chances. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced by United, but... It's not because they don't know their, or Salsi doesn't know their, their first choice 11. I think that, that demand for first, and you hear about Lampard as well at Chelsea. I think that demand for first choice 11 is not something that's really been, been that crucial for sort of 20, 25 years. Having said that, it obviously, you, you obviously do need a basic plan. You do need to have some sense of how you play. But, but changes within that, I, I think, are, are totally reasonable and, and fine. Yeah, I mean, one person you haven't mentioned there, Jonathan, is Van der Beek, who still crazily just doesn't seem anywhere near he does he can barely get off the bench he played in the in the cup didn't he but he, he just can't get even get off the bench should he be in the discussion well I, it's just baffling you know he, he's i think he started two league games um now everything i saw him at ajax said absolutely fantastic footballer but i think we have seen that generation of ajax players that when they've left they have found it quite difficult so, so frankie mm. de jong has not done brilliantly at barcelona um uh, De Ligt has not done brilliantly at Juve, so uh, you know, I, I guess Ajax is a is a very particular style of play. It is a very specific environment, and m- maybe it does take players a little while to to adjust to playing playing outside of that. Yeah, Martin, have you got a, a theory on Manu's best eleven? If you had to, if you had to pick it, yeah, I think it's one that they've never played as well. <laughs> I just think I completely agree with Jonathan's point that being able to rotate is only a good thing. But also at the same time, I do think with the elite level clubs, they've at least got seven, eight, nine players who you think they start every week if they're fit. With yeah. Manchester United, there's probably only five, which is quite quite strange. I think you're looking at probably De Gea, Wambasaka, Maguire, uh, Fernandez, and Rashford. Obviously, there are players like Bailly and Pogba who people might say now, yeah, they're definite certain starters. But over a longer period of time, they've, they've certainly not been. Um, so they aren't an, a nailed down team. And, and Jonathan says, obviously, and understandably, that obviously rotation, being able to adapt your tactics to the opposition is, is only a good thing. And it is. And obviously they did that against Burnley by bringing in Matic, Giovanni uh, for their sort of physicality. And they yeah. won that game. So you can't question that. But I still think having a few more players who are, who are definitely going to, you know, they're going to start. There's just that sort of consistency within the team that brings those patterns of play. And I think that if there's a question mark about Manchester United still, it's what are those patterns of play? What's, what's United's style of play? And you'd say, okay, they're probably best on the counter-attack. But in a lot of their games, they're not able to counter-attack. So is that their style of play or is that just how they'd like to play? Um, so I think that's one of the question marks over Solskjaer is, is, is that 
what is his what is his sort of mantra what is his style um maybe you don't need one but i just think having patterns of play is important and i think that's what we've seen at liverpool recently in terms of all the changes that they've had to make there's just this this hesitancy about their play now just because parts are being taken out from different places and that's going to affect you um so i think it does it does help to have more players that you know are going to play but i've gone for a sort of 4-3-1-2, which they've only ever played once this season. That was a 3-2 win against Southampton. But I think their best eleven on paper is probably De Gea, Wambasaka, Bailly, Maguire. I went for Telesh over Shaw, but it's pretty unclear. And then I think Fred, McTominay, Pogba, Fernandez in the 10 behind Cavani and Rashford would work. I don't see why that wouldn't work, uh, but it's not been played yet. But that's just the team that I would pick if everyone was available for Manchester United. Nice little team there. And I suppose over the last few years, Jonathan, Liverpool have had those eight or nine players that you, you can hang your hat on. You know they're going to get picked their, their first choice, but injuries are killing them at the moment. Do they need a centre-back this month? Well, uh, I mean, Klopp has suggested that's that's not going to happen, but you would think they probably do. I mean, to be without Van Dijk, Matip and Gomez, you know, those are three major players. And okay, Fabinho is is perfectly good at slotting in there, but I think losing him from a midfield does does detract from the quality of that midfield. I think he's their best. He's, he's the best one at playing that deep lying role, which yeah, a, Henderson yeah. can do it. But you know, I think he's better than Henderson at that. I think Henderson's better being that slightly higher position on the right. Um, so, do you trust Phillips? Do you trust Williams? Well, you know, he he didn't uh, the game against Southampton, which I I. I I mean, it seemed both, you know, it seemed striking. That seemed like um, a decision that you wouldn't take lightly. Um, and I don't know what that says to, the, to to Phillips and Williams. I don't know if that sort of says to them, well, we don't quite trust you against uh, against players of this quality. Uh, I don't know if it's a specific thing because I haven't played play two up that, that he, you know, he didn't trust them. In that scenario, where they, you know, where they're both going to have to mark rather than one, one dropping off, um, but you know, it's it's obviously a problem area. Uh, I, I, I guess, I guess the issue for Liverpool is that they they're clearly not as financially well off as some other clubs. Um, I think their signings generally have been relatively uh, cautious in terms of the amount of money spent. I mean, it's been very well targeted, and maybe this this is a feeling at the club that do we really want to spend on a centre back? when we already have three really good centre-backs, if they're all fit, plus Phillips and Williams coming through. So maybe they see it as being being not a priority. But you, you would think that, that for the very specific situation they're in now, if they could find somebody for 15, 20 million, it, it would be worth bringing them in. Even even alone, maybe. I mean, Henderson, as you say, played centre back in the last game. But one thing that made me laugh against Southampton, I don't think Jordan Henderson is ever in the box for set pieces. But yet, when he was playing centre back, he was, tre- he was trotting into the box right on for the corners, like he was this big burly centre back, and that, that really that really made me laugh in, 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 that, in that game. And Martin, what would you do? Because would 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 alone be something you'd look at? Because Phillips doesn't really strike me as a, as a player that suits Liverpool in the way he plays football. He's, he's kind of an old school centre back, isn't he? And Williams, as we saw, got got the run around against, against Villa kids, didn't he? The Villa's mini Messi, five foot Louis Barry, he brushed him aside and got through on goal and scored in the FA Cup. So it's a difficult one for the kids, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you've literally just taken sort of sixty percent of what I was about to say, but Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. I think Nat Phillips. I think he's 23. He's not a youngster. Yeah, just... And there's there's a reason he's 23 and hasn't played many games for Liverpool. And I, th- I don't think that's because he's a bad player. But what you just said, he doesn't fit Liverpool's style. He's a, he's a very good defender, but he's limited on the ball. And yeah, Williams, like you say, he was sort of held off by an eight-year-old, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> in the and he's only very young himself. And I don't want to discredit Villa legend Louis Barry. But, no, of course um, not. But yeah, they, that was that will have been a worry. That Klopp will have seen that and been a bit concerned. Uh, I don't think that will have necessarily been a big change in his thinking, but he'll have been concerned by that. And I think what you miss with Van Dijk and probably gets overlooked is is the way that he distributes from the back. And a lot of Liverpool's possession play comes from Van Dijk. He, most passes in the league last season. He's very good at playing forwards and making that first sort of vertical pass 
to set the team up and that's what they're, they're kind of lacking at the moment and it, it does affect even though he's a defender and they're missing defenders it does affect the way they play forward and and Jonathan also took one of my sort of talking points in terms of Fabinho who's been excellent there but he is he is an anchor to the midfield and Liverpool played their best football with Fabinho as the anchor to that midfield so while he's been very good they are they are missing him uh, so and then you're relying on Matip who you can't rely on in terms of fitness very good player if you had Fabinho and Matip until the end of the season they could probably win the title but you cannot rely on Matip's fitness um, no. so I think I, I agree with Jonathan I think they probably do need to make a move of some kind and I think they are considering it even though they're sort of putting out that that's not going to happen I don't think you're really putting a block on Phillips and Williams coming into the team because I don't really think that was ever the plan. I don't think Liverpool were ever like, oh, these, these are the two guys who are going to come in and take over. That's just been a, a forced situation. And I think it's telling that one of the, the, the one of the centre-backs they've been linked to the most is a player called Sven Botman at Lille, who's only very young himself. So I think they are trying to, they might try and sign a centre-back, but one for the future who is better than the ones that they have in the academy at the moment. I mean, Jonathan, who on earth is going to play centre-back against United on Sunday? <laughs> well, uh, Fabinho, I think we can be relatively confident mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is, if it's Cavani against or against anybody who's not, not brilliant in that position, he will destroy them because he's a really yep. good centre-forward with old-fashioned centre-forward's instincts. So, uh, I, I don't know, is the answer. <laughs> Fabinho plus one. Uh, and and I, I guess that I guess like, if it were me, my logic would be push Henderson back in midfield because I don't want to lose a midfield battle. I'd rather, I, you know, I'd rather win the game in midfield and you know, play the game in in uh, in United's half, uh, and then hopefully chances don't occur, and, and, and so you can sort of protect the centre back uh, in that way. But um, I. I I, I, I don't know. Uh, Fabinho plus one. It's a difficult one, isn't it? And luckily, it's not our job to do that. But Jonathan, you have had the job of picking your combined Manchester United and Liverpool 11 and pitting it up against the who scored statistical 11. I don't know whether I was supposed to do a team. I did do one, but I'm not sure anyone cares about that. So we'll just stick to the who scored against Jonathan. Jonathan, who have you gone for? <laughs> well, I think your team was very good, Dan. Did you, uh, did you see? <laughs> no, but you seem to need that affirmation. So, uh, <laughs> always from you. Oh, I always need it from you, Jonathan. Not so much, Martin. <laughs> um, so, uh, Alison in goal. Yep. Uh, Alexander Arnold right back, despite not having had a great season this season. Then the two centre backs, Bay and Maguire. Uh, I think they work well as a pair. The Bay's pace covers for for one of Maguire's weaknesses. I think Bay, when he when he's on it, is a really really good player. Um, you know, I first saw him, first really became aware of him at the Cup of Nations in 2015 when he was he was part of that back three that the Cotivar won that tournament with. Uh, so, you know, I think if he's fit, he's a really good player. Maguire's, have, after a dodgy start of the season, looks back in form. You know, is is great in the air and is actually better on the ball than people give him credit for. And that right foot, left footed combination, I think, is is useful. Robertson at left back, I think, is pretty obvious. Then the midfield, Fabinho at the back of midfield, uh, with Henderson to the right and Fernandes to the left. I don't really like Fernandes to the left. I'd rather have him to the right, but yeah, you know, I, 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 I think the, the the balance is right there. I think Henderson is is very useful in that sort of fill in role that we were talking about last week with Mason Mount of somebody who can who can drop back and screen the back four if necessary. But he, he also breaks forward and he will bring you sort of four or five goals a season. And then the front three is just Liverpool's front three, Salah, Firmino yeah. and, and Mane. Very nice. And how, how does that stack up against the who scored statistical 11? I should say as well that we you weren't allowed to pick Van Dijk, Gomez, people, people that are injured. Um, so only three differences, which is probably quite um, refreshing. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously this team is based on league ratings this season. Um, so that's probably the main reason by the first change being wan in for Trent Alexander-Arnold because um, it is based on this season's ratings. Uh, and then we have Joel Matip instead of Eric Bailly. And I, th- I personally, I'd, I'd agree with that one uh, for now. I think I think Eric Bailly can be an excellent player, and he's shown that, and he's he's definitely had more good games than he's had bad games, but he's just not had that many games. Um, so I think there's this sort of 
I, I do agree. Like over time, he has proven to be an excellent defender, um, and he's so strong, very quick, and he does ex exactly what Jonathan says. He makes up for what uh, Maguire lacks in a way. So there is certainly uh, encouragement in that partnership. But at the same time, he does he does have some sort of frailties. He does ha he does have these off games, and I think he had a, obviously he had a terrible one, and so did Maguire against Tottenham. So I don't I don't think he's this sort of um, all 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 sort of all conquering centre back that um, the Manchester United fans are sort of building him up as at the moment. He's a, he's a, he can be a very good centre back, but he, we need to see him do it for at least ten games in a row, which he's he's never done. In uh, fairness to me, I was counting Matip yeah. as being injured, so I didn't mm -hmm. even consider Matip. Yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a doubt according to my sources. Anyway, <laughs> he's not he's not a hundred percent out. Um, so yeah, that's fair enough. Um, he may well not play, uh, like you say. So so we'll see. And if it wasn't Matip, then it would be uh, Bai. His rating slightly lower. Uh, but other than that, it's all the same until you get to up front, uh, and it's uh, Rashford over Firmino for us has a, has a higher rating this season. Uh, Obviously, Rashford usually plays wide, has played up front this season. Um, but I think there's a problem with Rashford at the moment where they're playing him on the right. Yeah, his, his, his skill set's really being negated out there. Uh, and I think that's an issue. I, I, I was surprised that he played, I, I guess just because Martial has never played on the, on the right. But I think Rashford at his best is better than Martial at his best. So I'd rather have, I'd, I'd rather have Rashford... Cutting in from the cutting in from the left, where he's been excellent, whereas Martial hasn't even been playing on the left. So I'd, I'd rather sort of push him out to the right and see how he gets on, if you know what I mean. Um, so that that surprised me a little bit. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where where Rashford plays this weekend. Will be will be really interesting. Uh, whether Cavani plays, whether Martial plays, I, I'm not sure. All all three of those will will start. We'll see. But yeah, Rashford playing out on the right, I'm not really seeing. Almost like playing Son out on the right, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we won't talk about that. I mean, Martial went off injured, didn't he, didn't he towards the end of the game? So he, he did, yeah. He end. went off with a slight yeah. injury, so we'll see, yeah. He might be. I suppose with Rashford on the right, Jonathan, you could argue that he's probably a bit more tactically astute than, than Martial, and that's the reason he's out there. Probably, but it, yeah, I, I I just think he's so good at cutting in from the left. I, I don't really like him through the middle. I I, I think he yeah he's really good at the left, and and there's that sort of issue that he he doesn't sort of fit. Yeah, there's, there's you know a sort of sense that a forward should play through the middle. That that should be if it, you know if they're not playing through the middle, they're somehow just filling in. But you know I think Rashford is you know is one of these modern forwards who does come in from wide in the same way that Salah does. You're clearly not a winger. He's a forward who starts wide, uh, and. You know, uh, to 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 not have him coming in onto his better foot, I, I think is is slightly odd. I mean, he did play very well uh, against PSG coming in from the right. To to be fair to him, but yeah, I would agree. It doesn't seem naturally to get 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 the best out of him. Um, and you know, I, I the the reason I picked Firmino ahead of him was more just. I mean, partly because I you know I don't think Rashford's a centre forward, but also you know I just. If a unit works well together, pick the unit. It, it tends yeah. to be my logic, which is one of the reasons why I think I might have chosen by over Matip, even had I considered Matip to be available, just because we know Maguire and Bailly works together. Well, for those that are interested, I've obviously been spending a bit too much time with Jonathan recently because that was the reason that I picked my midfield the way I did in my team. Picked the same front three, Salah, Firmino, Mane, like you say, good unit. But I went for Fernandez, Henderson at the base and Vijnaldum. Because I felt he was more the more tactically astute of the central midfielders available on that left hand side of the, of the central midfield. I also did a bit of a wild card pick, Martin, in my in my centre back. Because I got to be honest, I'm not that keen on Boye, not keen on Lindelof. So I put Twan Zabian because I just think I think he's brilliant, and I think the way he played against PSG earlier in the season was, was incredible. But he never he never seems to get in the, in the, in the mix in the discussion for Manchester United centre halves, which I don't really get. Mm. Yeah, I think. I think certainly if if Bailly has a, has a has another injury or has another down has a downturn in form, then Manchester United fans for sure would like to see Twan Zabi come in before Lindelof. I think not because they don't like Lindelof, but just because obviously Twan Zabi has a much closer profile to um, to Bailly in terms of that pace and strength and being able to to cover for um, Maguire and have that balance. So I think if if Bailly were to drop out, I think we would see Twan Zabi now, and I agree. Never let Villa down for sure, and he's composed on the ball, and he's very, very athletic. Um, can bring the ball out from defence really nicely as well. 
So I agree, very good player. So I, I'd like to see him play more. And I think some a certain amount of Manchester United fans would like to see him play more. But Bailly's playing well at the moment, so you can't really begrudge them uh, starting him for now. And I think it's probably worth saying that um, for these combined 11s, we, we overlooked Thiago um, just because he hasn't really played. He started two league games, so to do it on, on rating... Uh, hasn't had that hasn't made enough appearances, but he would be my first pick in the team out of anyone. I just think he's that good. He's, yeah. His return for Liverpool could be a, could be a real game changer, just because they have been so sort of hesitant. They're, they've been very sort of pass sideways, pass sideways, cross, and Thiago just injects that sort of vertical pass into the team, and uh, he's my probably my favourite player to watch. I'm really, really looking forward to that game at the weekend, although it does concern me slightly because when Sky really hype the games up, they're always turgid and, and rubbish. <laughs> I remember that. I remember Red Monday when Liverpool Man U were turned right to Banfield one year and it was Neil Nil and Mourinho as one of the worst games I've, I've ever sat through and it was proper, proper hyped up on Sky. So that is a worry. But actually, another game I'm really looking forward to is, is Wolves West Brom at a local derby and that's where we start with you, Jonathan, for the Just a Minute section where mm-hmm. Martin and Jonathan get a minute to talk about the remaining fixtures. So I'll let Jonathan get his, his notes out. So Jonathan, Wolves v West Brom, off you go. Uh, Wolves have been in, in pretty terrible form of late. Uh, only one win in their last eight games. Uh, they haven't kept a clean sheet since they beat Palace at the end of October. Uh, now, one of the one of the issues is, is, is injuries. Uh, so Raul Jimenez, obviously, being the main one, but also Daniel Pedence is out. Johnny's out. Adama Traore is a doubt. Uh, Willie Bolly is out. And Fernando Marcelo is out. Uh, they don't have Diego Jota, who... who uh, you know, I think his selling him, I think, has been a, a big problem for them this season. Uh, so I think this is an opportunity for West Brom, badly as they've been playing. Uh, they're without Conor Gallagher, without Conor Townsend and without Carlin Grant. Uh, their last seven games in the league, they've, they've lost five and drawn two. And they went out of the cup to, to Blackpool. Uh, they've, they've let in 13 in four league games since Billich left. So the Allardyce revolution hasn't worked yet. But I think it does take time. Uh, I think we saw that at Sunderland. It wasn't immediate. So this is one of those games where I think West Brom really have to take something if they can have a chance of surviving. Very good. Bang on a minute. And I'll tell you what, has there ever been as many players missing from a football match as that? It felt like you went through both sides and everyone was out injured. That's, that's fascinating. Well, they were all going to be called Connor as well. I thought it was Connor, <laughs> Connor, Connor. <laughs> Martin, West Ham v Burnley. I mean, there's not many good games this weekend, is there? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, yeah, I've struggled to get a minute out of this. Uh, a real battle between two of the league's most physical sides, obviously. Burnley have won the last three against West Ham without actually conceding a goal. And the Londoners have actually failed to score in four of their last five games against the Clarets, either side of a 4-2 win two years ago. But all, all of their scorers from that win have since left the club. So you have to go back to 2017 to find the last time a current West Ham player scored against Burnley. And that was Mikel Antonio, who fittingly and timely is back fit uh, now. But the club will obviously need to buy in another striker this month, having sold Sebastian Allaire. With this fixture in mind, I think top scorer Thomas Salchek's aerial threat may be somewhat negated. Uh, by James Tarkovsky and Ben Mee, who've obviously been excellent since they've come back to fitness, respectively. Dwight McNeil made his return from the bench against United and could start for the first time in almost a month and should give them more of a threat, given his supply to Chris Wood in particular. The misfiring striker with three goals is the only Burnley player to score more than once in the league this season. I will say that I'm barely listening to either of you because I'm trying to utilise this opportunity to think of the answer to to the trivia, but I'm finding it very hard to think of the answer for the trivia with with you two talking, but we'll move on. We'll we'll carry on, Jonathan. Leeds v Brighton. Well, I I think I may have given you one of the answers in my last minute, but we'll uh, we'll see. Well, we we talked about injuries. Uh, I mean, Brighton have got nine players out, including Welbeck, Connolly, Lalana, um, Bissouma, Jachenbach, Lamptey, Izquierdo. Uh, so, you know, they're, the problems they've had uh, are, are compounded by, by, by all those absences. Leeds have got Llorente and Koch out at, at the back, which is you know, a huge problem for them. But at least they should have Liam Cooper back. But Calvin Phillips is suspended, so they, they, they lose that that figure from the back of their midfield. And they've really been in, in, in pretty rotten form recently. They've only won three of their last eight. That does include the brilliant performance against West Brom. Uh, they do tend to be better against teams who, who come at them, as I think Brighton will. 
And Brighton's problem this season, it, you know, it hasn't been the sort of builder play, hasn't been the play through the midfield. It's been finishing. They've got the sixth worst conversion rate in the league, and so that means that the chance Leeds will give them, they 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 may not be able to take advantage of in quite the same way. So I would expect Leeds to win this. Very good, and I will say that. Cock out wasn't a phrase that I was expecting to hear in the in this podcast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Martin Fulham VJ. Uh, since conceding ten goals in their first three games with the old guard at the back, Fulham, like I said earlier, deserve great credit for their recruitment policy this time around, particularly at the back. In the thirteen games that have followed that three game run at the start of the season, they've conceded just fourteen goals. Only Tottenham and City have conceded fewer goals since the start of October, which is pretty stunning. Uh, Lampard will be sweating on the fitness of Reese James and N'Golo Kante, who have suffered hamstring injuries in recent weeks. And I think they looked fatigued before picking up those injuries, having played a lot of games, and they were both excellent at the start of the season. The latter may be particularly important, his fitness, up against the power of Anguissa in midfield, who's been a real highlight for Fulham. Chelsea's new signings are all back fit and should be well rested, having had a week off since gaining some confidence in the cup. I actually think the likes of Werner and Havertz scoring against Morecambe Actually, probably probably only serve to highlight further highlight their struggles to adapt to the Premier League. I'm not sure that, that we can read much too much into that. So they still need a big game for sure. So this is a big game for both teams, the West London derby, obviously. Yeah, again, another game that I actually I'm looking forward to this weekend. After saying there's not many good games, your final one, Jonathan Sheffield United against Spurs. Well, Tottenham are in in very strange form at the minute. We sort of think of them as as having quite a good season, but they've only won two of the last eight in the league. Um, I mean, they were very very good in beating Leeds, but then. You know, a lot of the teams have been recently. Uh, and I think what's what's notable about them, I mean, we, we, we talked earlier about this habit of taking the lead and then sitting off. I mean, surely they wouldn't do that in Sheffield United, would they? I mean, maybe, maybe they would, but I think that'd be the wrong thing to do. Uh, but they, and I, this might have changed after last night. I, I looked this up before last night's game. Uh, but they were joint top with Leicester for conversion rate of chances. Now, maybe that just suggests how good Son and Kane are, but it also suggests to me that possibly that form of early season isn't sustainable, that they're not good enough through midfield. Although that does feel almost like a conscious choice. Sheffield United, obviously, they've done the, their best form of the season. They won two in a row, albeit one of them in the cup. Um, and maybe, maybe there is something beginning to flicker there. But they have failed to score in 10 this season. And so you think this might be quite dour. Very nice. And Martin, Manchester City against Crystal Palace. I think Man City named a stronger team in the cup against Birmingham than many expected. Um, even though they, they did rest a few players, but Guardiola was clearly keen to keep some momentum. I think having finally married that that improved defensive resolve with a renewed attacking impetus, Edison, Stones, Gundogan, and Sterling should return with the big selection dilemma still revolving around Phil Foden. Obviously, there's an increasing clamour from both the player and the English media for the youngster to become a regular now. And he started four in a row, so it'll be interesting to see at what point Guardiola rotates him and whether that will come this weekend. So he's he's one to watch. He's shown his versatility in recent weeks as well, he even played up front in the Cup as a false nine and scored in back-to-back games. He's now the club's top scorer in all competitions. Palace are still to play Arsenal on Thursday at the time of the recording, but have only lost two of their last five meetings with City and are unbeaten in their last two at the Etihad. However, their last win against a team currently in the top half of the table was across Manchester against United back in September. Yeah, and we haven't actually got the Villa and Everton game in this show at all because we think that's probably going to get postponed due to the COVID crisis ongoing at Villa Park at the moment. Well, well, we won't finish because we've got the trivia, but we've got the long shot next. So this is where we choose who we basically think are the teams you wouldn't expect maybe got a chance of picking something up at the weekend. Jonathan, I'll come to you first. Sheffield United to get something against Spurs. Ooh, uh, big. Just because I think Spurs are playing really weirdly at the minute. Uh, I think Sheffield United, just that little bit of confidence. I, you know, they haven't played badly this season. You know, they've lost, was it 10 games they've lost by a single goal? Um, yeah. I, I, and, and so a lot of it just sort of feels like momentum that, that sort of uh things aren't quite clicking for them and the fact they have had those two wins i mean okay they didn't they didn't play brilliant against newcastle by any means although i think they were the better side even before the the sending off and they did need the penalty the goal scoring is their their, their big issue but uh, you know I, I i do worry that spurs aren't quite uh attacking quite as effectively as they were i do worry that son and kane's goal scoring i mean you know kane took his goal brilliantly last night but you do worry that that, that they will stop converting chances quite so effectively so I think maybe there is there is a chance here um, that the, the, the Sheffield United could, could next something. And I remember in Sunderland's 15-point season, 
Uh, Daryl Murphy scoring a last-minute equaliser against Tottenham uh, in the middle of the worst of the run, and that goal being celebrated like, yeah, like someone that just won the World Cup or something. Uh, <laughs> so Tottenham are one of those in the same way that Newcastle lost to Sheffield United and would be the only team to lose to Derby in two thousand seven eight. Tottenham do just still feel, without meaning to be uh, uh, too much, this is the history of a Tottenham. It does feel like Tottenham the kind of team this happens to. Yeah, and as, as we spoke about earlier on in in the show, they've they've drawn games that they really shouldn't have done through the season and Sheffield United away. Who knows, Martin? Who have you gone for? I was glad you went to Jonathan first because I had two, and I, I thought he'd pick one of the one of the two, and then I could go for the other one, but he didn't. <laughs> I wasn't bold okay. enough to go for Sheffield United, so I've, I've still got a decision to make now. Uh, I'll I'll go reactionary based on last night, and I'll go for Fulham to get a result against Chelsea. My other one was Burnley to beat West Ham. I'm not sure if that's a mm. long shot. I think it probably is away from home to win. Um, yeah, but I'll, go for, I'll go for Fulham uh, to get a result against Chelsea. I just think they look really, really organised. Like I said in the section before, their defensive record, the section that Dan wasn't listening to, uh, their defensive <laughs> record <laughs> it, it has been really, really strong um, since October. So I think that can continue. I don't think Chelsea's sort of misfiring strikers will sort of worry them too much uh yeah so i think there's there's something there for the whites that was mine as well i, I actually think fulham are going to beat chelsea at the weekend they can take Burnley, you want. no no i'm going fulham i think fulham are going to beat chelsea not just not just pick up a point i think i'm going to Fair put enough. them neck on the line i think they're going to win really okay. impressed by them when they have played in recent weeks, because I know they've missed a few weeks as well. We're now going to finish with the trivia. And it's, as I say, it's been playing on my mind since it was mentioned on the show. Part of me hopes that Jonathan gets it just bang on because I don't think I've got a clue. But let, let's go. <laughs> Martin, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so only three current Liverpool players have ever scored more than once in their career against Manchester United. Right, well, I'm pretty sure it's none of the front three. Otherwise, it would be a slightly odd question. <laughs> and also, I, I have vague memories of, I think Salah scored last season against United and it was sort of a big thing was made of it being his first goal against them. Um, so I'm running out the, the, the front three just for, I mean, I can't remember them scoring apart from Salah. No. And uh, just on the basis of how questions work, I'm ruling them out. <laughs> so it then comes down to players I do remember scoring against United. And I have to say, I don't remember any of these players scoring more than once. <laughs> But my first guess is Diego Jota, just because I definitely remember him scoring once. And I remember Wolves, I think, twice, maybe even three times in the same season, beating United. And the way they would beat them is on the break. And he is the sort of player who scores goals on the break. So Jota is my first guess. Yes, correct. Two goals. <laughs> Thank you. So that was the one I was relatively confident of. Okay, so the one I'm going to go for second, and I, I'm pretty sure I remember him scoring against United for City. Okay. And it's basically on the grounds that he's so old, he must have done everything. <laughs> James Milner. Correct. Four, oh, which is the most. Goodness. Four goals against Manchester United in his career. So that so leaves me... You've for already the got a point. You could double your points here. So this leaves me for the final one with a toss-up between two of who are the other Liverpool players who could conceivably score goals? Um... I'm pretty sure, this is not my answer yet, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that I remember, I'm studying Martin's face here, that, that I remember Van Dijk scoring a header uh, against United. Um, but I also have a sense that Jordan Henderson might have scored against United. But I'm going to say Van Dijk. Incorrect, unfortunately. Ah. Has, has oh, scored no. against Manchester United. Has scored. Uh, and you're right, it's not the front three. They've all scored all scored one goal against well, Manchester United. Let, let, let Dan have his guess. Yeah, go on, Daniel. I'm stuck between two. Go cool. on. So, Vine Alden, for some reason, I, I feel like he's one, he scores in, in big games quite a lot, and two, oh, he's not a league, is for it? Newcastle. Oh. Ah! Oh. No, it's not, it's not, it's not. It's not, really, it's not really. <laughs> he, he, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't my second player. My second player was Oxlade Chamberlain, thinking he might have bagged for, for Arsenal, perhaps. If I was pushed. I will go for I'll go for Oxide Chamberlain. Afraid not. None of none of oh, those no. that he said. Not if I know them either. No. Yeah, and he scored one quite recently, last couple of years. It's Jordan Shakiri. Oh. Has two has two against Manchester United as well. So yeah. Yes. You were right yeah. to avoid the, the front three, that's for sure. 
So, yeah, Jonathan gets the point again. At least he didn't double up. Very well done, Jonathan. I'll tell you what, very, very impressive the first. To get the first two, bang on with your first two guesses, I think is very, very impressive. Well, that's, that's very kind. Thank you. I, I do remember the, the Jota goal, or a, a, one of the Jota goals quite clearly. So And, yeah, Milner's just so old that he's, <laughs> yeah, he's normally a safe bet. bet. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd have got zero out of three if you weren't here, Jonathan. It was just me against mine. I'd have got zero out of three there for sure. So that brings us to a close. Hope whatever games you are watching at the weekend, everyone watching the podcast or listening to the podcast, I hope you enjoy them. Thanks to Jonathan and Marty for joining me as ever. It's always good to have an hour talking about football with you. We'll be back next week. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give it a like and comment as well with your thoughts on the combined 11s. Can you create a better one than us? Probably. We'll see you next week. Thanks very much.